One of America's persistent myths is that the first European migrants to the so-called New World found a largely uninhabited continent. In a new documentary, today's guest brings alive the thriving cities, social networks, art and science of Native America. He's Gary Glassman this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller from the Providence Journal. Story in the Public Square is an effort to study, celebrate, and tell stories that matter. To do that, we sit down every week with the best storytellers around, authors, journalists, filmmakers, and more, to make sense of the big stories shaping public life in the United States today. To help us this week, we're joined by Gary Glassman, a veteran documentary filmmaker whose latest film, Native America, is a four-part documentary to be released this season on public television. Gary, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So, uh, th we want to talk about the, the film Native America. Uh, it's uh, going to premiere in October 23rd on PBS. We want to come to that. But let's start to let's start with, sort of with you and your origins as a filmmaker. Were you one of these people who made films as a kid that you knew you always wanted to be a filmmaker? Well. I always wanted to be a filmmaker but never believed I actually could because I'm born in the Bronx and grew up in Buffalo and guys like me usually don't go to Hollywood and make films. But uh, my earliest days I would uh, kick out uh, old TV screens and uh, do puppet shows in them. Um, so that was my earliest introduction to television. But um, um, the, the big innovation in my life um, that brought me into uh, TV was VHS. Um, VHS for me um, represented the democratization of uh, production and distribution and I could afford to get myself a VHS camera and uh, you know edit system and start working that way. How old were you when, when you were investing in filmmaking? <laughs> oh uh, gosh I guess I was uh, probably in my uh, late 20s. Okay. Now, um, in your bio, it says that for a time you uh, you actually uh, were in a clown circus. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Uh, um, it was an all clown circuit. It was circus. It was called the Two Penny Circus. Uh, there were eight of us. We did a clown and Commedia del Art show. We toured all over the states and Europe. Um, we were kind of a, a, a proto uh, Cirque du Soleil. And so, from a, from does does that kind of experience inform you, or sort of does that contribute to your to your to your filmmaking? I I, I think so. I mean, I think it, my my commitment is to um, popular entertainment, um, and uh, so puppets, clowning, uh, street performance, and television. Mm -hmm. So I think they're all sort of in the same realm of um, engaging uh, the biggest audience possible. Mm -hmm. And along the way, you got a degree at UCLA. Is that correct? Do we That's have right. That correct? I, I got I, I after my uh, clowning and uh, street performance days, um, I went uh, to uh, UCLA. I got an MFA in directing at UCLA. When was that? What time? What era? That roughly? was um, eighty. I graduated uh, from there in I think it was uh, eighty four. Okay, and then at some point after that, you were in Paris. Is that not correct? Yeah, that was um, that was uh, just before I got here to Providence. Um, 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 I uh, met my wife. Um, she wasn't my wife when we met. Actually, <laughs> um, we met in L.A. and uh, uh, she had a position at the Sorbonne the following year. And so I kind of hustled my uh, a friend uh, to uh, commission me to do a screenplay, and uh, I went off to Paris. Very nice. And then you came back here I, when, as I understand it, your wife received a professorship at Providence College. Is that she, that's how uh, you wound up? When we, were in, when, when we were in Paris, I thought if things worked out between us, um, we'd move back to L.A. together. But she got a job offer at a place called Providence, Rhode Island. And uh, 
here we landed. It took me a little while to unpack my bags. Um, I actually looked for even jobs as a Cadillac salesman. I never thought I'd make media here in Providence, but I kind of hooked up with um, the uh, documentary um, community up in the Boston area. And um, I was um, actually a pretty hot editor uh, coming out of LA, and uh, I got uh, a job on a new series for uh, Discovery Channel, and uh, me and my uh, producing partner at the time were sort of the dynamic duo of the Discover Magazine series for uh, uh, Discovery Channel. And so now you're, this is, you've made more than 50 films. Uh, your latest is Native America, uh, which is a look at pre-Columbian America. Is that? Well, we, we initially, uh, when we uh, defined it, we thought of pre-contact, yes, pre, uh, the, wor the world of uh, the Americas before Columbus. But um, the more we immersed ourselves in um, the the content and 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 very specifically uh, engaging with native communities, we kind of left Columbus behind. I think we might mention him once in the entire series, and really flipped it to um, the world created by America's first peoples. Mm -hmm. I mean, the idea was that um, here was a, a world that was totally cut off from uh, Europe and Asia and Africa uh, for. Um, well, geographically for millions of years and um, from a human population uh, standpoint, it was cut off uh, for, uh, I don't know. Uh, Millennia, for sure. For yeah. sure, yeah. at least 25,000 years. Right. Uh, so it was a world that, cr that uh, developed all in and of itself, uh, like a, practically a parallel world to the rest of the world. and and. It developed in a way that is unique to um, the Americas. Um, the basic um, premise for it um, and the basic idea for it came when I was doing actually my first Nova in uh, about the year 2000 and it was on a Maya king. Uh, uh, a tomb was found and I had a scoop to uh, go down and film it and um, I'm crawling around in a, a tomb of the the, the, the dynastic founder of, uh, of Copan, this jewel of a city in Honduras, and uh, here are these incredible temple pyramids, um, beautiful sculpture and paintings, um, uh, uh, a writing system that was, you know, one of the only unique uh, original writing systems in the entire world, and um, uh, astronomical knowledge that surpassed Europe at the time. This is the year 400 uh, when the, the Copan dynasty started. And I just was wondering where did this all begin um, and is there a connection between what's happening in uh, Central America with North and South America. So the, the sort of the, 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 the seed of the um, idea actually was planted right there in that uh, tomb from 400 uh, CE. Among the many issues and, and topics that you get into is the social networking, the networking of, of these various Native American peoples from South America to North America. How, how did that work? How did, how did one culture from, say, Central America communicate with a culture in Southwestern North America and so forth? I mean, that, to me, that was astounding. I had no idea that there was this vast communication and cultural exchange. Yeah. Well, I think par part of the even the, the where that question came from was that um, as I started diving into uh, the, the content um, about, uh, you know, are these beliefs uh, and cultures shared uh, across North and South America, um, um, I quickly, through conversations with Native scholars and uh, uh, non-Native scholars, uh, it was confirmed that yes, there is. You could you could say that there is a foundational belief system that's shared across um, the Americas with a diversity of expression. Um, so then it became a question of well, what is that belief system and how was it shared? And uh, that's where some of the um, stories actually came from. So, for instance, um, in the first hour. Um, we establish um, 
the foundational belief system and this concept that it is in fact shared and we do it um, at a place called Chaco Canyon in New Mexico uh, and we do it with uh, the Hopi, Hopi people. Um, and what we learned through our collaboration with um, our Hopi friends um, is that in Hopi uh, tradition Chaco Canyon, which was built around the year 1000 uh, and had a population of about 20,000 people, uh, was a center for uh, sharing knowledge about nature and the powers of nature. And it's a strong uh, tradition amongst uh, the Pueblo people of, of whom the uh, Hopi are part of. Um, but uh, part of the concept for the, our series was that we were going to be looking at uh, the Americas through the lens of native knowledge and modern scholarship. Well, there was a discovery, um, uh, an archaeological discovery made there at Chaco where they found these cylindrical pots that resemble the shape of pots that are only found in uh, the Maya area about a thousand miles away. And in those pots, they found the residue of cacao, which is the ingredient that makes chocolate. Mm -hmm. Now, cacao grows over a thousand miles away. So clearly, uh, there was some kind of exchange going on where people were coming uh, with these materials. But these materials um, were not, it was, and it wasn't just cacao, it was shells, um, shell ornaments carved, um, and the shells originated from the Pacific and the, and the Gulf of Mexico. Um, there was uh, um, uh, uh, tropical birds um, that uh, were brought from South America, and uh, many other kinds of um, objects that were found there in Chaco that came from thousands of miles away. But these weren't objects that represented some kind of, you know, valuable jewel or something like that. They didn't have a monetary um, value. They had a cultural value. They represented um, um, scientific and spiritual ideas that centered around um, the forces of nature. One of the things that I think you get to in the film is the, sort of the engineering marvels, right? The, the, these were uh, 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 these, were, these were civilizations with large cities, with uh, uh, monuments of construction that still exist today, if you think about the pyramids uh, in parts of Central and South America. Um, what, 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 tell us more about what you learned and, and sort of what we know about these uh, societies as a result of these, of these uh, uh, testaments to organization and, and, and engineering skill. Well, that's, that was, it was a surprise to me um, and I'm sure it's going to be a surprise to the television audiences that, uh, you know, uh, North and South America had some of the largest cities in the world um, during their time. Um, um, we filmed in a place called Teotihuacan, which is outside of um, Mexico City. It's an ex extraordinary city of um, pyramids and housing and um, um, in uh, the year uh, 100, there were 150,000 people living there. Wow, 150,000? Yeah. Um, it was one of the largest cities in the world at that time. Um, and uh, it was a cultural center. In the same way that Chaco, people would come from thousands of miles mm -hmm. to be a Chaco, people were coming to Teotihuacan. Um, and what's extraordinary about it, one of the extraordinary things about it is that it is aligned to celestial events. First of all, it mirrors the natural world around it. So um, the pyramids kind of mirror uh, certain sacred mountains that are uh, in, on the horizon. And, um, and the entire city is um, a giant um, calendar, a synchronized calendar um, that is synchronized to uh, the solar uh, calendar, but also um, a sacred calendar of the uh, of many of the uh, indigenous people of uh, uh, Mesoamerica. Um, it's uh, one that represents the uh, human gestation. So there are two kind of synchronized calendars that almost work on a sort of a gear system. And at 
certain points where they align, there were major festivals. And those alignments always occurred with major uh, celestial events. And, and some of the promotional stuff that I've seen, um, it looks like you use uh, some animation and some essentially renderings of what these uh, urban centers look like. From a storytelling perspective, wh what does that get you that you can't get from just showing the, you know, the, the, the ruins of the, of, the, of the temples that still exist? Well, it's, um, I mean, you know, one of the challenges of making any kind of historical documentary is how do you bring the past alive for a television audience and animation, um, both um, uh, 2D animation and 3D animation um, are powerful tools for that. Um, but all of our 3D animation um, was done uh, in collaboration with the foremost archaeologists um, in those specific areas. Because the, the, the authenticity has to be legitimate, right? Because yeah. the, otherwise it's just sort of a fanciful fantasy. rendering. Yeah. yeah, no, this is not fantasy. This is, this is the best um, possible uh, uh, estimation of what these places look like. One, one place that just totally blew my mind um, is uh, there's a city called Cahokia. Um, it too was a, around the year 1000. It was, um, it's outside of St. Louis, Missouri. Um, it was a city of over a hundred pyramids, earthen mounds aligned to uh, uh, s celestial events, moon, sun, s certain constellations. Um, and uh, it was the largest city in um, North America, uh, north of Mexico City, until Philadelphia surpassed it in the 19th century. Wow. That's incredible. I think this is going to be such an experience for, for viewers. So let's roll the beginning of episode one from Caves to Cosmos, which answers a 15,000 year old question who were America's first peoples? It is another world, thriving with a hundred million people, connected by elaborate roads, bridges, and social networks spanning continents, with some of the world's largest cities aligned to the heavens. It is the birthplace of some of the greatest civilizations on Earth. This is the Americas, more than 500 years ago. So in doing this film, in creating this film, which took many years, as you've already alluded to, you were, uh, you were careful, and, and, uh, careful to involve indigenous peoples, from the narrator to musicians to events and, and ceremonies that you witnessed. Talk about that, how that adds to the authenticity, and also how how you got the cooperation of the, a vast number of, of different uh, Native Americans living today, obviously. Well, um, my first hire was um, my series producer, uh, Juliana Branham, who's Comanche and who has um, um, independent filmmaking and PBS experience. And um, we um, and, and my entire team at Providence Pictures um, cast a really wide net in terms of um, research. Um, but uh, Juliana and I went out and met with um, many Native communities um, to talk about um, what um, our vision was for the series, that it truly would be an authentic vehicle for um, Native knowledge, and asked um, what uh, these communities would want other people to know, uh, what knowledge they would be willing to share. And uh, so we spent at least um, a year just talking to people, going out, talking to Native people, going out, uh, hearing their stories, um, um, and uh, working out uh, what they were willing to, to share. Um, and. Um, the communities through uh, um, um, faith keepers, leaders, uh, just community members um, were involved um, in the entire process. So um, each hour 
we had one, um, at least one uh, native consultant uh, from the community in which we were closely working and made sure that uh, whatever we were um, going to be broadcasting would be authentic and and that we weren't showing anything that uh, they wouldn't want to be seen. So, so in that early stage of gaining trust, you had to essentially sell yourself. I mean, there have been so many negative images of Native Americans historically, if you look at media and certainly Hollywood going back, that here's the stranger who shows up and so you had to build trust. Is that not correct? For, for sure. I mean, yeah. that's, that's, that's um, the, the bottom line. And, um, you know, it's not, first of all, um, the distrust from the Native community is totally understandable. I mean, 500 years oh, absolutely of genocidal, you know, warfare mm -hmm. and politics right. Right. Um, has uh, contributed to that mistrust. And so there's every reason um, to not trust um, yep. anybody else to tell their story but themselves. Um, but this was the, the, the people who chose to participate and share their knowledge um, have, um, uh, I think, a, a, a mission to, um, you know, I mean, it, it, it may sound um, simplistic, but um, many of the Native cultures um, see themselves as protectors of the earth and um, see it as a responsibility um, to you know take care of all living things um, and uh, and I think many of them understand that we are in a crisis now in terms of our our, our environment and uh, they have incredible knowledge that could be very helpful to everybody you know one of the things that uh, struck me was uh, you you tell the story of a uh, native population in upstate New York that was uh, developing democracy 500 years before the Declaration of Independence. Tell, share a little bit of that story with, with our audience. Yeah, that's um, the Haudenosaunee. Um, uh, they're often called the Iroquois or five or six nations. Mm -hmm. um, they, uh, um, they live in upstate New York uh, and the um, central um, nation amongst them are the Onondaga uh, and uh, they have the story of uh, the peacemaker and Hiawatha um, and uh, for generations the five nations uh, the Seneca, um, uh, Cayuga, Onondaga, uh, Oneida and Mohawk were fighting amongst themselves and it was brutal and um, a the peacekeeper, uh, the peacemaker comes uh, and recruits Hiawatha as a disciple, and uh, they spread the message of peace amongst all of the um, warring tribes. There's one holdout, uh, and it happens to be the the warlord of the Onondaga people, and finally he's he's convinced, um, and uh, the story of um, the coming together, the end of war, uh, and the coming together and the formation of the first democracy is uh, memorialized in something called a wampum belt. It's a tapestry of, of shell beads that uh, represent the story. And just two weeks ago, um, ev annually, um, the uh, different communities come together and uh, have a, a reading, a, a recitation of the great law of peace, which is the, the rules of how to get along um, and uh, the foundation of democracy. So when the um, founding fathers, um, you know, came to uh, the Americas, um, they heard of this uh, democracy. It's a three part democracy um, um, that uh, our U.S. Constitution and th three branches of government um, very closely mirror. One, um, two, wow. in 
two incredible, um, and there's, a, there's plenty of evidence of this exchange. It's, in fact, um, um, the, uh, in Philadelphia, the Founding Fathers uh, um, gave a house to the Haudenosaunee to come and uh, be close to advise them on, the con on how to write the Constitution. Wow. Boy, this is unknown until yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the one uh, the, they ha they have a couple other uh, you know parts of their um, governance that uh, maybe we could learn from. Uh, one is that uh, women are kind of like the Supreme Court in the sense that they, the the clan mothers um, serve for life, and they can appoint and impeach the chiefs um, if they're not if the chiefs are not serving the people, and. Um, and the other is that there's a, a, a sacred um, commitment to taking care of uh, all living things. Message for today from, from the past in, in America. Well, and the thing is, they're still alive and well. Absolutely. And they're a sovereign, they are in fact a sovereign nation. They don't vote in our elections. They have their own form of government. They have their own passports. Uh, um, and uh, their relationship with uh, the U.S. is the same as if uh, they were Canada or Mexico. They have treaties. Sovereign nations, yeah. Uh, Gary Glassman, uh, the film is Native America. It's on PBS beginning in October. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, that's all the time we have this week, but if you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit PellCenter.org. He's G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis, asking you to join us next time for more Story in the Public Square.